Hey guys, about a year ago I made a video covering the Holland region from the Pokemon trading card game. Now I'm back with a much more popular region, yet one we still don't quite know that much about. Today, I'm going to talk about possibly one of the most nostalgic locations in the extended Pokemon universe, the Ore region. This is the location of the GameCube spin-offs and owners of the best video game soundtracks to grace our nation, Pokemon Coliseum and Pokemon XD. Despite having two full games take place here, we aren't even given as much history as you can find in just one library in Sinnoh. That being said, this video's goal is to absolutely dig into what they do give us and piece things together ourselves. Though everything I'm going to say is 100% true on every account, be wary that a lesser man may say not to take me seriously. I'm not a lesser man though, so not only should you take me seriously, but you should subscribe, and like, and share, and tell your friends, and comment, and become a member. Gird your loins, because this is possibly my most convoluted and spoiler-filled theory crafted yet. Let's get into it. Ore is a Jotonian mining colony. While you begin to process that, let me explain. First is the awful geography of the Ore region. It looks awful, and mostly no Pokemon live there. Who would colonize a place like that if they didn't have a very specific reason? This brings us to Pyrite Town, where the aforementioned mine resides. An NPC tells the player that though the mines are closed, there was once a man who made a lot of money from them. This implies that there was a greater force over the mines, and this would probably mean they had a chokehold on the economy of the region. This money was obviously not going back into Orr's economy, otherwise so much of it wouldn't look like shit. Instead, the Jota region would trade the resources for Pokemon, as there was none native to the region. In a world where Pokemon exist, I couldn't imagine agreeing to move somewhere where there weren't any. This shipping of Pokemon would continue, even after most of the ties between the regions would be severed. Regardless, this means that the money was going back to where this benefactor was, which as we'll see moving forward would be the Johto region. I plan to come back to this in a second. Along with Pyrite Town came Gattenport, which served as the spot where Ore would export mined goods and import both people and Pokemon from Johto. It also spawned the center of recreation, the Kooky Crab. I mean the Candy Crab. I mean the Killer Crab! Sorry. It also spawned the center of recreation, the Krabby Club, a place where sailors could rest between their voyages back to Olivine Town in the Johto region, which not only serves as the region's main harbor, but is conveniently placed close to the Ore region in the Cerebi Pokeworld map. It claims on the page that it isn't 100% accurate, but the fact that the same map was used in a canon Pokemon game means I am validated in using this geographical convenience to my advantage. The final pillar of early Ore was the Agate Village, home to those who worshipped Celebi. This practice of worship is very common in Johto, see the Ilex Shrine for example. The equivalent in Ore is the Relic Stone, which is known modernly as the place where Celebi first landed. This is the only place in Ore that shows any real signs of flora, which geographically speaking is very uncommon for a desert region. It becomes a lot more possible when you look at Celebi's original Pokedex entry, which claims that where it goes follows beautiful and lush forests. It came from Johto because it knew the people who worshipped it were most in need. Even knowing this, it's pretty obvious that Celebi didn't help the rest of the region, though it was still a hearty attempt from the people of Ore to find someone who could bless this mess. As it goes with any voyage, whether it's for discovery or colonization, there needs to be a benefactor. This is where necessary funding will come from. It's safe to assume that whoever paid for it was the same man I mentioned earlier who made all that money from the mines. Who is the very notably rich and suspicious man that you meet while on your ore journey? He's bald, potentially evil, monopolized much of the economy. Any guesses? Yup, Mr. Virich. Even though he's quite old, he was probably not old enough to have started the mines though. He probably only inherited it from his father. There are a lot of NPCs that indicate that multiple generations have lived through ore, furthering this theory. This sounds like semantics, but being a spoiled rich kid from birth makes a lot of sense considering his actions moving forward. Mr. Virich, who we later find out is named Grievel's father or grandfather, was probably the one who led the charge to reap the ore area of all of its resources under the approval of the Johto region, kind of like companies do here in America all the time. Once the resources were gone, Virich and Johto pulled out and left the region in a state of economic and disorderly despair. Kind of like companies do in America, all the time. The epitome of this was the Under, which is an artificial town made for the miners to save them the commute back to Pyrite Town. 
This once thriving mine town becomes essentially the slums of ore after the mines closed and the financial support left them behind, and now it serves as a home to many members of the gangs that run rampant throughout the region. After his family's mine closed down, Grievel needed a new way to pile on to his already abundant wealth. His name literally means greed and evil, of course he wouldn't have been satisfied. This is what spawned the central plot point of the ore games, Shadow Pokemon. Shadow Pokemon were versatile in the methods they could be used to attain money and power. They were sold to people, they were used to threaten people, and also put on display in brutal battles that people had to pay to watch. Using these Shadow Pokemon to take control was a lot easier in a rundown region like Ore than it would have been in Johto, and so the main branch of the evil team Cypher was located here. Grievel wouldn't be caught dead wasting his time leaving his estate in Johto, so he left his task in the hands of Ivice, who disguised himself as the mayor of the region's Phoenix City. As any true Ore gamer would know, Wes defeats Ivice and stops the Shadow Pokemon operation as a whole. Or so we thought. Between the events of Pokemon Colosseum and XD, the events of Pokemon Gold and Silver take place in the Johto region. This is where Grievel, being a citizen of Johto, would lay witness to the awakening of the legendary Lugia. Something as big as that would totally have made the news, and Grievel's old, and old people watch the news, right? After seeing Lugia, Grievel knew he was ready to start the Shadow Pokemon project once again. Remaining members of Team Cypher who were working on projects outside of Ore were sent to retrieve Lugia, and through some godforsaken means, they succeeded. They then used this Lugia to capture a ship, coming from Olivine and Johto, and stole all the Pokemon aboard and left the crew for dead. Now that things were getting serious and his previous subordinate failed him, Grievel began to move closer to the Ore region to look over things himself. There was no risk this time, there was no way he could fail. In short though, he did. And it's implied after his plan failed a second time, he accepts defeat and turns himself in for his crimes. Though this is the end of his story, it isn't the end of the relatively even more arbitrary connections I've made between the two regions. Next, I want to focus on the boy who took down the evil corporate greed, Michael. Michael, like most kids in the Pokemon world, was excited to start his journey. The difference between him and most other trainers was that his region didn't offer a very traditional journey. Because of the geography, it's not easy to get between towns, and there are no established routes. This means no gyms, and no Pokemon. Because of this, it may be possible that the Pokemon journey that Michael was eager to begin was actually not the one from his region, but ones that he would see on TV. Like, he didn't even receive his first Pokemon from the region's professor, but instead his father, who died while on the ship that was captured from Lugia. Being a child, it's easy to believe that his desire for a real Pokemon journey would go past what was available to him at the time. What was available to him was a series of stadiums that have no real cohesion between them. From a gameplay standpoint, this makes sense. You need a way to add extra battles to the game and make up for the lack of gems. But it makes sense in universe too. The region was not meant to be a league recognized region, but simply an extension of Johto. The only reason there are even stadiums is because the people needed a way to entertain themselves. The closest they have to a gym is the pre-gym, ran in the center of Phoenix City. Phoenix City, being the most evidently wealthy part of the region, wanted to make itself seem fancier by connecting itself with the more well-established regions. It was making itself more cultured, if you will. It has a gym to model one you'd see in Johto, and even serves as an academy, teaching only those fortunate enough to live in the wealthiest area in Ore. The intentions of this aren't as immoral as I'm making it sound, however. In reality, the technological opportunism in Phoenix City allowed the gym leader Justy to give the trainers of Ore not only education, but a taste of what the rest of the Pokemon world had to offer. I'd say it was an amazing business decision, but he doesn't even make you pay. I like to believe that after the events of Pokemon XD, Michael was able to travel to one of the more fortunate regions like he always saw on TV. Maybe he even got to go to his region's parent region, and see all the wonderful things that Johto took away from Ore when the Venriches ran out of use for it. Full circle, let's wrap things up. I can't begin to explain how excited I've been to make this video. My old lore theory video is one of my favorites, and when I began to develop this idea, I felt the same excitement as I did all that time ago. I also finally had an excuse to talk about the Ore games. I love them so much, I even wore my Shadow Lugia shirt when I met Veronica Taylor, who was the former voice actor for Ash. I have an entire playthrough of Pokemon Coliseum recorded from a video that I wanted to make more than a year ago. 
Hopefully we see something new from this awesome side series in the modern day. And even more hopefully, it will do nothing but confirm all of the truth that I spat during this video. Until that day comes, be sure to like, comment, and subscribe. It's free so you will always get your money's worth.